Welcome to our Get Into Rugby series, where we chat with sleek sensations in the rugby community about the exciting non-contact opportunity that will connect rugby clubs and rugby entrepreneurs globally in growing the game. I'm Dallin Stanford, World Rugby Commentator, and with me is two-time World Rugby Sevens Player of the Year Olympian and Flag Rugby X Advocate Perry Baker, plus one of the all-time greats of the game, Olympian and human bulldozer, Danny Barrett. Welcome, you legends. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, what's up? Awesome. Well, firstly, Danny, I'm glad you locked away in a cabin in the woods, so you're not terrorizing the defenses. I want to start out. Uh, how is parenthood treating you, my friend? It's great. You know, it's it's frustratingly beautiful. You know, the the days are slow, but the weeks, months, and years go by, you know, in a snap of a finger. Um, but, you know, just being able to see someone develop, you know, a, a, from, you know, not being able to move, not being able to do anything other than breathe on their own, to now this almost two-year-old little gal running around screaming, you know, just a few minutes ago, she was uh, popping bubble wrap upstairs. So, you know, it's, it, it's an awesome feeling. Oh, I, I love that. You and your missus must be so proud. You know, um, I, I want to touch on, of course, your rugby. This is uh, uh, why we, we lucky to get to talk to you. You know, you've recently announced your retirement from professional rugby, having played in two Olympic games. You represented the USA in sevens and fifteens. You finished with the Houston Sabercats in Major League Rugby. There's a lot to unpack there, of course, but just a couple of memories that, that come to mind if you look back on that last decade of you playing the game, uh, particularly for the USA. Yeah, I think some of the some of the best ones are you know, obviously the back-to-back -back LA, uh, the first cup final in 2015 in London. A, a special one for me was, was always going to be the World Cup in San Francisco, you know, being in my backyard, having – been to AT&T Stadium where watching the Giants win World Series games and kind of having everything come full circle there. But I think, you know, what, what a lot of people don't talk about is the time spent outside of the game with, you know, guys like Perry and yourself and, you know, creating relationships, you know, around the world. I was on the phone with my mom yesterday and uh, I'm headed out on a trip next weekend and Peter Tiberio is in the area. And Hey, man. You know, I, I need a place to crash for a night. What's going on? So I have friends, you know, all over the world, all over the country that kind of no matter how long it's been since you've talked to them, that you still have that relationship. You have that bond. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a special kind of fraternity that we're all a part of. So I think those are some of the fun ones. I think, you know, the times in the changing rooms after the games, you know, after wins, definitely, um, but, you know, some of those those hard conversations as well. I mean, Perry and I have had our disagreements in the past, but, you know, that that made our friendship and our bond that much tighter because we were able to get over things like that. Um, so, so it's those kinds of things that creating relationships and and helping each other become the best version of, of ourselves is, is really what sticks out to me from my career. My highlight is every time you got the ball. That was just a highlight because I know you knew something's going to happen. And my, I've told this to you before. One of my favorite memories is you break through in the game of sevens and there's a try on the line, easy score. And the sweep is coming back and they're like 20 meters to the left. And you turn your angle and you're like, oh, oh hold on, hold on. There's a defender here, the sweeper. And you've got a little bit of history with a player and you ran straight for them, bulldozed them over and then scored as well. We were just like, oh my goodness. Only Boom Boom Barrett can do that. <laughs> there's a reason behind that. <laughs> yeah. I would, and the reason that, yeah. was... <laughs> The reason was not only did I enjoy the contact against a smaller player, but Madison's conversion percentage would go up something like 20 to 35% if you were inside the 15 compared to outside the 15. Okay. So I would always at least try and get to the 15 to give him a better chance at getting two more points. See, the tactician And it just well. happened to be that someone was in the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. And then, Perry, I need to know from you. You play with Danny for so many years. What is he like as a teammate on and off the field? Uh, Danny's a great teammate. Um, he, when it comes to professionalism, that's him. Um, there's no cutting corners. And uh, it took a while to, like, get to know him on that end, to, like, understand it. But at the end of the day, it's like you're appreciative of that, to have that person that – that's stern down to the T of being professional, how to be a professionalism. And then uh, 
it's fun outside, like you said, to have those those hard talks. You know, it, it's almost like when you really think about a brother, like I don't know how you guys were, if you guys got older brothers, I know Danny do, but we have those arguments, we had those those tussles and stuff, but then you get over it. And that's your brother that you always go to battle for. And this is how Danny was, you know. It, uh, we had, like you said, we had our disagreements here and there, but we came to know each other and drew a bond to uh, of a brotherhood that that we I still talk to him sometimes to this day, just out of the blue, or randomized, or send him a message or whatnot. But he's a great teammate, and uh, I miss him I always. Every time I see him, I'm like, you want to come back one more time? But uh, just because, like like you said, like not just the 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 boom boom part of Danny, but just the way that he carried himself and how the team. Uh, morale around him and bought and he bought the team together, you know. So and that was just something I feel like we missed. And like, can you just come back to just show that so people can understand, you know? So he's a good teammate, you know. I mean, I beat him a few times in a couple, couple, uh, couple chugs, but we'll keep that one out for right now. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the same saying as me beating you in a foot race. <laughs> hey, you're, I got I've never you. lost a Perry in a race. <laughs> I like how Perry pulls out the one time it happened in 10 years, you know. Danny was probably had his shoulder in a sling, couldn't even move his arm properly. So it really was technique. It wasn't even the ability. So um, I could have beat him with a straw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, this is why I love having two teammates on that have shared so many memories. And and, and it's not just, as you said, the playing. It's you're traveling around the globe together. You, you know, any sort of companies every, every single day. So uh, you, you do know each other so well, which which is great when you meet up afterwards and stuff like that at events. Okay, I want to touch on the Rugby World Cup 15s. We just saw the South Africa win the World Cup, but for the first time, we didn't have Canada or the USA playing. Of course, disappointing for our region here in North America. Danny, I want to ask your opinion. What needs to happen to get more people just playing the game, touching the rugby ball for the first time here in, in the US? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the big things is, is getting into kind of the underserved areas of, of rugby in the U.S. You know, having those kind of, you know, the the greater Pacific Northwest, Montana, you know, the deep south, you know, different these different pockets where rugby's not, you know, a very recognized sport in the community. And getting some of the players like Perry and Steve and Naya and low and getting them out into the community in those parts of the country to me personally those areas are the lifeblood of the culture of rugby in the u.s so giving them you know their time of day and and saying hey we 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 appreciate you we appreciate what you've done we appreciate everybody that that continues to work so hard to grow the game but as well as that is you know it's the technical, tactical skill aspect of things. And, you know, in some of those areas and, and some of, you know, just the general areas throughout the country, wherever it's overserved or underserved, you know, the players that are on the teams right now on the men's 15 or men and women's 15s and sevens are the best players, the best people in the country to then become coaches. They've been training at the highest level for, you know, seven, eight, 10, 12, 15 years and have had, you know, some of the best coaching accessible to any players in the country. So we need them to get out and, and share their knowledge and their skill sets with the greater public. And, you know, when you have someone like Perry, who's leading this initiative with flag rugby, his name is a draw. When you have Naya and Nicole and you know, all these players that can go out into different parts of the country for a weekend. We can have them draw players in, men and women's players, young boys and young girls, into the community and, and understand really, you know, who that person is. And, and as much as their rugby skill on the field is a big draw, it's the people that they are that's going to get, you know, parents and families and grandparents interested in the game and, and how that the game and its cultures and values really grow human beings and, and what they get out of it from, you know, a human growth standpoint to be better people in society. And I think that's what a lot of people don't look at, at rugby as being, they look at it as a hooligans game played by gentlemen. Right. But it's, it's really, you know, a gentleman's game played by gentlemen. It's very physical. It's very tough, but the people, both men and women, boys and girls are such great people to be around and to, to have your, 
you know, my daughter to look up to and, and Perry's kids to look up to one day to be, you know, I want to be like them athletically, but that's also a darn good person. And, and that's what as parents, you know, I, I strive for, for my children and my daughter now to, to become is, you know, an upstanding person of society. And if it's via rugby, great. I love that. But, you know, that's the way I think we get more people involved is, if someone has a brand or someone has a name, we need to get them out and get them visible and meeting more and more people uh, throughout the country. Yeah, Danny, that's that's a, a brilliant point because I remember being a youngster growing up in South Africa and we had, you know, one or two ex Springboks that came down to our training session. I was a young kid, 10 years old, and I was like, I would love to represent South Africa. Obviously, I wasn't good enough, so I, I, I eventually uh, uh, still stayed in the sport, though, and that was a great thing. But having that, just that, that feeling of having the young – a uh, young kid look up to and to absolute legend. And I saw uh, Ben Pinkerman, of course, is doing that currently. He worked with the US under 23s in the sevens game and they we won the Rugby Town sevens. And having an influence of a player like yourself, like Perry, recently retired players that know the game so well. And that aspect you bring, rugby's values, it is so different from the other American sports. So once people do try it and they do you know, take part in the camaraderie and uh, and the friendships and everything that come from the sport, they realize it's a lifelong game. Whether or not you play for your country or not, is irrelevant. You still want to be a part of that community, which I think is great. So, Perry, you and I have been working on growing the game, of course, through Flag Rugby X. And, and Perry, how would you describe that non-contact game to those that haven't seen it? Oh, I, I basically just let them know how it's like it's the same concept as rugby without the tackling and the, the contact elements of it. So you still have the passing, the running, the evading defenders and all that good stuff, the fun, all that good stuff to go in. So I, that's how I basically will break it down to them, like, Pretty simple. And the great thing is also it's quite similar to sevens, right? So like somebody like Danny that would compete for the kickoffs, you could do that in, in Flag Rugby X where you can't do that in a normal non-contact game. Right. And the, uh, what I love about the sport, obviously, is that we got, we're going to start with clubs. So we're going to do women's and men's clubs first, adult clubs, and then we're going to work down to the youth area, starting California and then expanding through. And we'll meet up with you, Danny, in your area, of course, uh, when we get going. I want to switch across to another topic. So, um, you know, countries like New Zealand, South Africa, England, quite a few of the rugby playing nations have a good, strong base of non-contact rugby players. Um, we have several regions that play it here, but it, it's not a massive sport yet. Um, so, Danny, how do you expose more people to trying something like a non-contact offering, you know, like Flag Rugby X? Do you think that'll help push the sport forward? Yeah, I, I definitely think it will. And, and I think it's a good avenue to get into schools as well, you know, yeah even more so than clubs. I think once we get into the school system, that's kind of how it's an easy way to get people playing the game. Hey, it's a PE class. The students don't have a choice in what the sport that they're playing is. Hey, if it's a six week block and you're playing rugby for six weeks, great. You know, you now have a six week block every, you know, every semester or whatever it is. So, you know, 12 weeks a year, that they're, you know, being put into this game and, and playing it and learning, you know, not just about how to play and how to pass and do this and that, but again, everything comes back to the culture. And I think, you know, in, in my coaching experience, that's what, you know, young parents enjoy the most is that culture aspect of how, you know, their kids stand taller and stick their chest out a little bit more. But I think, you know, one of the big parts of it is if you look at, you know, uh, like Australia women, the Australia women sevens have some of the best skills in the sevens game, not just men or women, not just women, but in the world, the way that they can move the ball, they can pass, everything's perfect. You know, a lot of those players come from a touch background and, you know, touch flag background. And I think for us as as an American group, as a, as a country, you know, moving forward, if we can start our kids in flag and touch rugby earlier and longer, you know, not just a couple years, you know, if they have four, five, six, seven years of just touch where they're having to be super diligent on passing technique and understanding defenses and beating defenders, that's a big part of, you know, how we elevate that next level you know that national team level and the professional level like if perry didn't come in at 39 years old 
like he did, <laughs> then, you know, his skills might have been a little bit better. <laughs> you know, it, me as well. You know, I started at yeah. 14, but if I started at 7 or 8, you know, my skills would have been that much better. And if we can get kids playing, you know, that very developmental skill level game, like a touch or a flag and, and understanding the very basics of it, of, of, like I said, how to pass, how to catch, how to read defenses, how to set up defenders, how to beat defenders one-on-one, two-on-one, three-on-two, that kind of stuff. Then once they get into the contact aspect, you know, if that's the route that they do choose to go, then, hey, look how much better you are, how much more developed you are than a player who started only contact rugby at 15. And, and that's a big thing for me is is almost looking exactly at how Australia women did it. Touch rugby was huge for them, and and they won Olympic gold in 2016. So it's a pretty good kind of blueprint of, of how to do things. Yeah, you can see watching the Australian woman play, how they manipulate space and how you can see it in the game of seven so, so quickly and easily. Another thing I love about it too is at a young age, it's great to see young boys and girls playing co-ed, non-contact rugby, flag rugby, whatever it is, and getting that confidence and, and, and playing with all their friends, uh, which, which, which is really fantastic as well. Perry, you've obviously done a lot of the Flag Rugby X Games as well. You know, what have you noticed about developing? Because you've had quite a few new players that have come, uh, one or two from the NFL as well. Um, how have they found it? Oh, man. So uh, it, it is crazy because, I, I, like, when I first did this back in July, I, I wanted to see, like, how, how it went and what people took from it. And what I kind of realized is, like, this is a need, but it's also a want. Mm-hmm. So I plan to do this only one time for a family and friends kind of day, just so I can become more familiar with things since I'm doing it myself. And the same thing that happened in July, guys was like, can you do this instead of waiting until January? Can you do this every week? Like, I'm telling you, we'll get people to come. Like, this is so fun. So what they're realizing, I have some people that's coming out there doing it for fitness purposes, like to get in shape kind of deal. Because like, I won't just go run on my own, but I'll run around doing this. So um, I, I found it so fun. And then uh, the other thing about um, what I'm realizing is how Danny was just saying the skill levels. So w- with Flag X, you have to implement kicking in, you know, and like for kicking off, we implement three different ways. But then when you score, you have to grubber your, your extra point. So these guys are, are are doing that now where they're developing their skills. Like Danny said, I picked this up so late. I wasn't taught any skills. I could just run and then I picked the game up once I became on the national team, which is so late. And what makes us so far behind is we're coming to a national team and we're not developed. We're coming there to get developed instead of coming already developed. So as Danny was saying earlier is these guys that just start picking this up by playing this type of non-contact, because the biggest thing when you talk to people about rugby, first thing they talk about is the collision and the contact of it. So now you taking this contact stuff out of it is totally different. Like the first thing my son said to me when I had him out there playing a couple of weeks ago was, I, I know this is only flag and it's not contact, but I can play this game is what he said to me. And, and, and his mind is he understanding it's not just flag, though. It's the contact part, you know. So once you start getting that in and implement with the skills that you're doing now, you have guys that are actually grubbering in the game now. And you got guys asking, how do you do that? That's so cool. I want to I want to know how to do that. So the skills are getting going up. It allows the skills to come into play. Uh, the fundamentals of the game with, with the whole passing, with the how to support line and all that good stuff, how to beat defenders, how to stay in shape with your defense. Because I had a guy who played, he was a defensive back. And he was like, can I just jump out of the line and go get it? I'm like, well, there's two two things that comes with that. And he, and he was picking it up so fast, which is so cool to see these guys pick it up. He was like, if I jump out, can I dive and intercept? I'm like, yeah, you can intercept it. But here's the kicker. When you do that, you're creating doll legs. And he's like realizing that. And he was like, so then I have to back. I'm like, correct. So he's realizing if you're jumping out of line, what can happen? So all this stuff is coming into play now. So with these guys picking this type of style of the game up, maybe it's a pathway for them to now transition to, to the traditional style of rugby when they start building their confidence and and, their, and and the experience of the game and all that good stuff. So um, I just find like this is a want and it's a need and it's just so fun. Like you said, like it's co-ed. You got, you got girlfriends coming out there and things like that. You got girls that are coming to play and it's just so enjoyable all the way around because now 
That's what drew me to rugby, the camaraderie of it. Because now my friends are coming because I'm inviting my friends. And then it's just a big brotherhood, you know, and, and it's such a respectful game because after you play in all the competition, you're you're having fun afterwards. Like well, the first time I did this on Family and Friends Day, it was like, OK, that is over now. You know what? We're going to go all to the taco shop and we're going to get tacos and, and, and hang out and eat. And that's what it's about, you know. So I just, like I said, in the, the day, I find this a want and I find this a need. And I just feel like this is this is everything to get the game to grow and where we want to take this game in the U.S. Yeah, and it's such a safe environment as well to oh. introduce those skills like Danny and you were saying, which is great because I know when I was co coaching rugby uh, at a university nearby here in Los Angeles and we had football players came across to try, it's a lot to get in one or two weeks just to learn that, hold on, I've got to stay in my line. I can catch the ball impossible, but then I need to stay backwards. I can also tackle. There's so much going on. It's such a complicated game to teach somebody at 20-something years of age or at your age, Perry, when you're nearly 40. But uh, yeah, as a young kid playing, everybody's good with games because you're like, oh, this game, you just got to beat this person one-on-one -on -one or pass the ball. So it's a great entry to, to the sport. Yeah. I want to switch across to another topic, which is fascinating. The NFL, they're obviously struggling to you know keep their contact numbers up. And they're focused on flag football. So particularly with girls playing the sport, and it's even in the LA 2028 Olympic Games. So it almost seems like, Danny, do you think rugby could somehow seize that opportunity to roll aggressively out to existing rugby clubs, universities, and, and kind of get more people into the game through that, that pathway? Yeah, absolutely. You know, with you know, the context side of rugby being introduced to the Olympics, you know, just a few years ago, I, th I think, you know, that's, a natural progression, you know, and, and the way that, you know, the world is going almost away from contact sport, you know, finding another outlet for that to be able to play the same, the same game with the same skill requirements, you know, a, a lot of it is very similar. And I think, you know, the, the way the NFL did it with getting, you know, flag football in, you, you can go to any college campus around the country right now, and there's going to be a philanthropic event and it's going to be a, a flag football. You know, almost any high school, you know, uh, a, a women's flag football. You can go to almost any high school around the country and they're going to have the powder puff football game, you know, at, at halftime of, you know, a homecoming football game. And that's great. You know, it's, it's usually coached by, you know, former high school football players, former college football players that are in and around and, and want to be a part of it. And you're also seeing this massive interest from NFL players themselves. You know, if they put flag rugby in, P, hit me up because I'm there. I mean, I probably would still run into someone on accident. Just <laughs> out of habit, but, you know, that's me. So maybe I'll be a coach and they'll let the faster guys play. But, uh, yeah, I definitely think, you know, there is an avenue. And I think that flag football going to the Olympics – is really going to open the market for flag and touch rugby. You know, once people see that there's another option that, Hey, flag rugby is great. You know, that flag football was so exhilarating in the Olympics. Well, we got a local flag, a flag rugby team here, which isn't all of that different. And it's a lot of, a lot of skill required, but we're willing to spend time and teach you and, and build your, your acumen up together you know everybody learns from everybody in our game it doesn't matter if you've been in the game for 50 years and played at the highest level or it's your first day of training and you know you're trying to figure things out there's questions that those you know new to the game players that'll ask yep. that someone like you know one of the three of us have never thought of before or or it requires us to break the game down to such a level that you didn't think you'd ever have to do that so we're, we're always going to learn and, and we encourage those people to come out and play and be a part of it and be a part of the community because we all just want to be better, better rugby players, better athletes and better people. And, and that's how we do it via, you know, more avenues to play the game. And what you guys are doing is, is creating that flag X is creating more avenues for different people of different backgrounds and different communities with different cultures behind them to be able to play something that is so near and dear to, to all of our hearts. Well, Danny, we're going to get you on our, one of our teams. That's for sure. We already, we already said we're going to get an alumni side together taking on uh, the current crop of players. So that'll be good, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Then you get to show your skills now. Your little chip and chase and grubs and stuff, man. Hey, man. My first te- or my second test match, I had a fifty meter touch finder. So, hey, need me. Yeah, hey, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Perry. Isn't it always all the forwards want to kick? But obviously, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So okay okay but uh, uh, short caveat <laughs> to that before every saber cat game we would play kick tennis forwards versus backs yeah they had to change the rules for the backs because the backs couldn't win <laughs> they, they they won one time oh that's amazing a dozen a dozen games so yeah there's something to be said there we're, we're gonna need to do a case study on that season yeah we will <laughs> we will indeed now, listen, we talk about the, the flag rugby being the Olympics. Perry, once you're done taking part in the Paris Olympic Games, can you get flag rugby into uh, the Olympics for us? Hey, that, hey, I'd love to get it in there. Some kind of way we'll figure it out. Okay, good. Uh, Danny, before we let you go, we, we, we know you're doing and you're set to do fantastic work in growing the game, growing the sport of rugby in your new position with the Golden Eagles. For our viewers out there that don't know, can you give us a bit of insight into what the Golden Eagles organization is and what are some of your goals? Yeah, so the Golden Eagles are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, centered around supporting our USA men and women's sevens athletes. And through that, you know, our, our, our big program is the CARE program. And CARE is an acronym for Career Advancement Rugby Enhancement. And what we strive to do is, you know, take guys and, and gals that finish college or finish high school and go straight into the national team. You know, wh- what are they going to do when – their playing days are over. You know, you, you spend you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 months a year training to be the best at your craft. So, you know, that that is your job. So how can we help those players and those athletes, you know, focus on something outside of the game to when the, that final whistle blows and you walk off the field for the last time, that you're prepared for life after and the second half of that, that's the career advancement side. The second half of that is rugby enhancement. And and Perry's done this super well over the last, you know, five, six, seven years in that not only is he looking at his career aspect, you know, what am I going to do after, you know, starting business, you know, with Flag X, with the Perry Baker rugby camps. And, and that requires him to think in a professional mind of, you know, how am I going to do this? What do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? Where do I need to get funding? And how does all of this work to, to move things forward, as well as bringing the game to a number of people, a.k.a. rugby enhancement? He's out in the community using his knowledge and his skills that that he's gained over the last 10 years. And and even before that, the five seconds he played in high school, that you know this is what I can do for myself and help set myself and my family up but also to give back to the game that has given us so much. And and that's what we try and do is, is really work with athletes holistically on what do you need? How can we help you? You're, you're 18 years old. You're just out of high school. You know, we need to teach you how to do your taxes, how to, you know, keep a checkbook and, and, you know, certain things that you don't learn that's just kind of thrown on you, you know, a couple of times a year to, you know, the players that are, you know, 26, 27, 28, who have, you know, a master's degree, you know, a college degree, Joe Schroeder's uh, working a full-time job. How can we support you at the same time as supporting this younger player and everything in the middle at, at exactly what you need? So that's, that's where we're at. That's what we're doing. And, you know, trying to move the needle for rugby in the country. We know that if our men and women's sevens teams can medal at an Olympic games, we're going high and right real quick, right? You know, the game is going to explode and that's exactly what we need. And that's why we're here. We're here to help the programs get what they need, help the players take care of themselves after rugby and give back to the sport that has given all of us so much. Well, Danny, I, you know, Sevens is personally very close to my heart. And I just love, you know, you talk about players staying in the game after they retire. So whether that is coaching, whether it's starting your ventures, and I love that you've straight straight away after you've finished the next week, you're in your full-time job here and you're helping grow the game, which is really fantastic. We absolutely love it. We want to thank you for joining us on the Get Into Rugby series. People can get more information if they head over to our Tag X International website. 
and contact the Tag X International team directly to get the game at their club or their region, or they can reach out to Perry and myself. We can answer any questions of our socials that they have. Danny, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Boom Boom Barrett. It is always a pleasure to see you, to hear from you, and love what you're doing currently, my friend. Thank you. P. Bake, you slippery sensation. Looking fast there, buddy. Uh, so so we'll get that down-down race off the record. We'll get that going just to see, just to double-check, to uh, see if, <laughs> if you were able to beat him because, again, I, I think you could be uh, talking spice. <laughs> I could beat him without my hands. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Boom, boom, Barrett, out. See you later, you sleek sensations. Thank you, too. There you go, guys. Thanks again. Much appreciated, Peace. you stars.